today I'm going to kind of switch gears from the plant side of things and talk a little bit about um, insects. And I'm hoping that my screen is up and, and all ready to go. Um, all looks good. Thank great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about spruce aphids. Um, for those of you on the, the canine, this may or may not be something that you've heard of. It's, it's fairly recent um, on the peninsula, but um, we, we know a little bit about it. So spruce aphids are small green aphids. Um, that's what's in the picture here. Um, they are, are very fortunately colored to match pretty closely to the spruce needles where we normally find them. So that makes them a little bit hard, hard to see and, and gives them some protection and camouflage in the environment. Um, they're a pretty standard looking aphid, pear-shaped, um, very small in size, about 1 16th of an inch long. And like all aphids, they have these um, projections coming off the, the um, posterior end. So they're called cornicles. Sometimes we call them tailpipes, uh, just as a fun way, but all aphids have those. Um, yeah, they also have piercing sucking mouth parts. So this is essentially like a, a straw-like mouth part that they insert into in in this case, the spruce needles, and then suck out the suck out the sap. Um, spruce aphids are native to Europe. They're not native um, to Alaska. They they do occur um, in other areas of North America, particular, particularly in our sick spruce forests. I um, mean, these these insects are highly temperature dependent, and I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Um, We've had spruce aphids present in southeast Alaska for quite some time and, and really had our first notable outbreak in about 1967 or so in Sitka. Um, they are a recurring pest of Sitka spruce in southeast. And then um, in about 2015, they were detected on the western side of the Kenai Peninsula um, in Homer and then also across Kachemak Bay in the Halibut Cove area. Um, and then the forest health community in Alaska has, has done some annual surveys since about 2016 to document presence and spread in the area. Um, in Alaska, the hosts for spruce aphid are sp spruce species, um, especially Sitka spruce. Um, so that's really what we focus on when we're looking, when we're looking for them during those surveys. They're primarily feeding on the older needles um, so about, you know, in about three weeks, we're going to start to see that that bright green flush of new needles coming from the tips of the branches. Spruce aphids are really interested in the, the needles that occur behind those on the branch. Um, and again, that that piercing sucking damage tends to cause a yellowing or a browning in the needle um, that can lead to some premature needle drop can also lead to reduced kind of overall reduced tree vigor, vigor and growth loss. Um, and that's what you can kind of see some of that damage in this picture, um, some, some kind of yellowing, and it, it almost appears like a stippling on the needle, and then it will turn um, kind of a, a more tannish or a brown color um, before they might fall off the tree. Spruce aphids tend to feed um, kind of uniquely in their timing. So a lot of our insect pests, you know, are most active in, in the summertime. Um, spruce aphids we see in the spring and in the fall, and they, they kind of um, take a break in the summertime, and, and they're not maybe as easy to find. And so we're, we're looking for them mostly when they're doing their, their uh, more active feeding in the spring and the fall. So our surveys historically have been uh, once in the spring and, and then again in the fall, mostly. <laughs> Um, here's another picture of some of that feeding damage and some of the aphids. You can see see a small aphid here and a small aphid here and some of that yellowing of the needle that's associated with their feeding damage and then the, the browning. And I'm, I'm hoping that my whole um, images can be seen on the, the shared screen. Um, if not, my photo credits are missing. And so um, just take a quick minute to thank uh, Elizabeth Graham, who works who's, uh, with an entomologist with the Forest Service down in, in Juneau for a lot of the, the photos that you're going to see today. Um, and then this is a, a picture that is um, kind of showing what the spruce aphid damage can look like at the landscape level. So the trees can look just really 
um, really unhealthy and have this overall kind of brownish cast to them. So really, really quickly on temperature, um, a lot of times what we'll see in recommendations is um, 14 degrees used as a kind of threshold for when we're, when we're gonna start to see mortality um, in spruce aphid populations. Um, some, some more recent short-term lab studies have shown that between about nine and 12 degrees Fahrenheit is when we start to see about 50% mortality in the population. And then closer to four degrees Fahrenheit, um, most of the individuals in that study died. Um, and so, you know, we're still working out what some of the temperature thresholds might be for Alaska, but this is kind of where we're, we're looking for, um, you know, when we we're thinking about what our winter temperatures were and how that might impact the coming spring um, spruce aphid populations and things like that. So I say that to say, um, this table here is looking at the, the number, the sum of days that are 14 degrees or less during our kind of late fall um, through early spring time period. Um, and this was this table was uh, created by Alex Weninger, who was a Forest Service seasonal um, and now works for Cooperative Extension. So um, it's kind of adapted from a report that she wrote in 2020. But a um, couple of things to, to really highlight here is that in this um, October 2014 through March 2015 time period, we had 10 days that were 14 degrees or less. And the um, other column here is the, the minimum temperature during that whole time period was eight degrees. And then in the summer of 2015 is when we first really detected spruce aphid on the Kenai. That following summer, we also had a, a very small number of days that were um, 14 degrees or less, and then a pretty high minimum um, temperature. And then we continued to see some spruce aphid activity in 2016, got a little colder, um, 2016 20, 20, um, to 2017, um, had a little bit of activity um, in 2018 and 2019. And then the winter 2019 to 2020, we had 44 days that were 14 degrees or less, and then an absolute minimum temperature of negative four. And when we did our fall, um, our October 2020 survey, uh, we didn't find any, any aphids. Um, we didn't do a spring survey in 2020 because of COVID. Um, this is all pretty basic kind of looking at some of these temperatures. This, this particular table only shows the temperatures from the weather station at the Homer Airport. There's a lot of other weather stations around there. Um, I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to dive into some of that temperature data and maybe look at the years that we're finding in, finding aphids and the, the areas that we're finding them in um, and, and kind of look that in the lens of some of the temperature data that we have. So. Um, don't want to overwhelm me with too much temperature data, but we do, we have seen a bit of a trend of in the winters that are warmer, we tend to see aphids and we tend to see them in, um, in different places or newer places if it's a continuing year. And then after these colder winters, we tend to see less spruce aphids or we tend to see no spruce aphids. And a quick caveat there is seeing no spruce aphids doesn't necessarily mean that they're not present. Um, because they are so small, because they can camouflage, it could just be that we're not, you know, checking, we're not checking every single tree. That's a fact. Um, so we might just be missing some of the population in those years because the population is so low. So then how, when, and where to look for spruce aphids. Um, because they tend to be these spring feeders and fall feeders, we want to start in mid to late winter, depending on the year, if it's a year like um, like 20, uh, 2020, 21, I'll just go back here. So we had 33 days of less than 14 degrees. Um, a third of those were in March of this year. So um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting in, in late winter of 2021 to look for them. Um, kind of have to think about what the, what the current um, weather and climate data tells us there. Um, so that might be more of a, a spring starting in, in spring. Um, 
looking at the underneath side of the needles, that's mostly where they're hanging out is a good place to start. And those previously infested trees, if it's known, um, spruce aphids are not highly mobile on their own. They do have or can have a, a winged generation, but a lot of them are wingless and they're relying on wind and animals and humans um, to transport them to different places. And so oftentimes our previously infested trees are gonna be our um, currently infested trees unless they've been treated. Um, and then if you do find them, monitor, monitoring kind of weekly through spring is a good idea and then checking those trees again in the fall. Um, this can be a visual inspection. When we do our surveys, we tend to just do a visual inspection where we're looking at different um, branches along, along the tree. Um, you can also use a beat sheet method. This consists of a, a um, you know, kind of light colored, either piece of fabric or, or even just a sheet of paper on a clipboard that you hold underneath a branch and then tap on it. And then you can observe what falls onto, um, falls onto that, that sheet or that piece of paper. And if you want more details on, on um, spruce aphid monitoring, I think this was mentioned in one of the sessions yesterday, but we do have a new um, spruce aphid monitoring video that's up and can be found on the Forest Service website. Um, and then I can, I can post a link to it in the chat when I'm done here. Um, make sure you guys check it out. It is delightful. All right, so on to some of the meat of this, the management and control. Of course, with um, most of our, our tree and shrub pests, good tree care practices are a great place to start. So provide supplemental watering during dry periods, avoid unnecessary injury to trees, um, is gonna you know, give them the best or the best start in this situation. Um, spruce aphids and aphids in general are soft-bodied insects. They're relatively easily controlled with a variety of different means um, because of their, their small size and their, their soft-bodiedness. Um, they can be sprayed off of trees with water. That's probably best on, on pretty small trees. You don't wanna try and spray them off of a really large tree. Um, insecticidal soaps are another option um, because the aphids are so soft-bodied, it's just a good uh, insecticide. Um, product for, for aphids, um, I would recommend the use of a commercial insecticidal soap. It's gonna have the active ingredient potassium salts of fatty acids, um, as opposed to something like a, a dilute dish soap. Um, oftentimes those products are actually detergents and they can be really damaging to plants. The one thing to, to keep in mind with insecticidal soaps is that they can, um, they can strip or, or or degrade the waxy coating on some of our needles. This is most mostly a problem with ornamentals like Colorado blue spruce that get the, the coloration from that, that waxy coating. And so that can, insecticidal soaps and some of our other insecticides as well can, can remove that. And that just changes the look of the tree. It doesn't really harm the tree. Um, it just changes the look of it a little bit. Uh, about two minutes, Jesse. Thanks, Betty. Um, a couple other, um, uh, things about pesticides. So synthetic insecticides, most of our insecticides are going to be effective against aphids. Um, I've listed here some active ingredients that are some of our more common active ingredients in our tree and shrub products. So if you're looking at like a, a foliar spray, um, permethrin's a, a pretty um, widely available active ingredient, comes in a, a lot of different products. Astro is, is one of those. Um, Foliar sprays can be tricky with spruce aphid because a lot of the trees that become infested are in coastal areas near waterways. And we wanna really be cautious about use of, of product around those, um, uh, around water and things like that. Um, systemics can also be really effective. These are, these are insecticides that are gonna move within the tree. A lot of these are applied as um, soil injections or soil drenches and then are taken up by the roots and moved to the area of the tree where the insects are gonna come into contact with them. Um, acephate, imidacloprid, and dinotepheron are, are all really common in our tree and shrub products. Um, imidacloprid does have a product uh, called Pointer that can be applied via injection or as an implant into the trunk, kind of like what Gina was talking about with some of the, the herbicides that are, that are implanted. Um, but again, there's a, a lot of ways to apply some of these. What is really important is the application timing when choosing your product or 
or choosing your product and then understanding the application timing. So those soil drenches and soil injections are gonna be difficult if you're trying to control aphids in the spring when um, maybe the snow isn't melted or the uh, soil is still frozen. It's hard to, hard to drench the soil when it's not um, percolating, you know? So um, that's an important thing to think about. And then again, just know the restrictions of applications of some of these sprays, especially near water. And that's particularly important with spruce savage when a lot of a lot of the infestations are occurring closer to some of our waterways and also in some pretty windy areas. So uh, keep in mind the restrictions around um, when products can be applied and, and drift and things like that. All right, I don't wanna rush through too much, but um, I did wanna give just a couple things. There are some, some insects that can either be confused with spruce aphids. We have giant conifer aphids. They are dark in color. They're often more often found on the, the twig and branch tissue than on the, the needles. Um, so that's one way to kind of tell them apart, but they can cause similar yellowing and browning of the needles um, like, like spruce aphids do. Similarly, woolly adelgids um, can cause some of the same yellowing and browning of the needles. They, uh, they are accompanied by these wonderful white woolly tufts that actually cover the insect bodies. So that's pretty easy to tell them apart, but in the absence of, of seeing some of that um, wooliness, just know that they can, they can cause some yellowing and needle discoloration as well. And then also our needle cast diseases um, can cause the needles to change color in similar ways. Um, all that's to say, um, finding actual spruce aphids, those green aphids on the un underneath side of the needles, the, the best way to assure that that's the pest that you're dealing with. If you have questions about, um, you know, just needle discoloration and the absence of the actual insect itself, um, reach out to Extension, reach out to myself, or reach out to someone else with the Forest Service, and we can help with identifying what's going on with your trees. Um, and so I will wrap up and say a huge thanks to a lot of people who have been very involved in, um, you know, kind of uh, figuring out what's going on with spruce aphid in South Central. This is a, a very quick and dirty um, overview of, of what we know right now. Um, and there's hopefully more to know and hopefully we see, we see less spruce aphids, but if you do, I hope you at least feel now that you could identify them and know a little bit about how to control and manage them. Visit keenyinvasives.org to learn more.